So I've got this picture because this is kind of what we think about horses in our world today. We think pastoral, we think equine therapy, you know, we, we think gentle and sweet and you know, emotional care animals almost, <coughs> right? Um, however, in the ancient world, horses meant one thing, and it was war. Now, and this is actually a clip from the 20-year-old remake of Planet of the Apes, but I thought it was a really good picture of a war horse. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, not too many apes in the Bible, so this is not from, from that. But that's, but that's the idea, and, and they didn't really have armor like that on their horses. But you know, horses were the ultimate war machine in the ancient world. And, and really, up until the time machines gun were, machine guns were invented, horses were still, in the U.S. Civil War, horses were huge. Um, so the, the first use of horses was with chariots, and the Egyptians were famous for their chariots. We'll talk about them in the book of Exodus here in just a minute. Um, and a chariot would typically have three people on the platform, one to drive, one holding a shield, and one holding a spear or a sword. So, but that's, that was kind of the original use of horses in warfare was the chariot. And then eventually they figured out how to put saddles on and whatever those things you put your feet in, you know, to keep, to keep you from falling off a horse because that's not obvious. You got to have something to keep yourself on the horse if you're going to actually go to, go to war with it. So in the ancient world, horses were used for basically one thing, and that was war. And so pretty much all the references to horses in the Bible are this kind of thing. And we'll be looking at those as we walk through them. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read a few verses from Jeremiah 46 just to give you, a, give you a feel for that. Prepare buckler and shield and advance for battle. Harness the horses, mount the steeds, take your stations with your helmets, sweat your lances, put on your coats of mail. And then few verses down, it says, Advance, O horses, and dash madly, O chariots. Let the warriors go forth, Ethiopia and Put, who carry the shield, the ludum who draw the bow. So in other words, that's the picture of a, of a battle. That's the picture of warfare, is, you know, saddle the horses, mount the steeds, you know, get in the chariots. Now, okay, I'm going to just... Re a passage from Job, and I'm just going to read it, and I want you to listen to this passage and feel how the, you don't see this very often in the Bible, but there's an emotional connection here. As we read, this is a description of a war horse from the end of the book of Job. Now, this is the part of Job where God appears in the, in the uh, whirlwind he says, where were you when I created the earth? And then, it, and then it says, did you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrible. He paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength. Uh, maybe not quite yet. Uh, he goes out to meet the weapons. Oops, wrong one. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver, the flashing spear, and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. We're talking about a horse now. All right. Fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. He cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains and the war cry. All right, now that's, there's some anthropomorphism going on there as to reading human characteristics into the horse. But you can kind of feel that whoever wrote, you know, and this comes from God in the book of Job, but this is a story of somebody who is really identifying with a horse, right? I mean, that's, some of us feel that way about our dogs. Some of us feel that way, you know, Tammy Montalvo does equine therapy. You know, she helps administer that. And that's the kind of feel is we've always had kind of this emotional connection with horses. Uh, and ugly, <laughs> I mean, 
but but I mean that's one of the few kind of instances we see where there's this we feel like the horse is hearing the trumpet and saying aha I'm ready to go now horses probably did not like fighting as much as we think they do although to be fair I don't know horses I've never been around horses I assume they really like to race because I don't think you could make them do it if they didn't want to so I mean I'm told that horses really love to get out there on the track and really have a competitive spirit in them. Now, how much of that is anthropomorphism, oh, anthropomorphism and how much of that is real, I don't know. But this is kind of the, again, this is a striking poem about a horse, about a war horse, and the emotional side of that and the emotional connection with humans. You can, you're reading, the, you're reading the, your own emotions into that of the horse, you know, fair or not. Oh. <clears throat> so the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea, deliverance from Pharaoh. Let's turn to Exodus real quickly. Exodus chapter 14. So we know the story. Moses comes to Pharaoh, let my people go. No, no, no. Ten plagues. We talked about the plague of locusts last week. Uh, and then finally, as they leave, then... Pharaoh gets his army together, they jump on their chariots, and they follow the people out to the Red Sea. And then we know what happens, chapter 14, starting with verse 9. Uh, Israelites, the Egyptians pursued them. All Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his chariot drivers and his army, they overtook them camped by the sea. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there's no graves in Egypt that you've taken us out here to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians and die in the wilderness. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. And then, you know, we know what happens. The, the people get through the Red Sea, you know, the Red Sea parts. Israelites get through the Red Sea. The Egyptians then decide, hey, if they can do it, we can do it. So they bring their horses and chariots and army into the Red Sea, and all of a sudden the Red Sea comes back. The horses and rider he has thrown into the sea. And the follow-up of that is chapter 15. And Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. That's the song of Moses. So, and this is, in some ways, this, this is the crucial story in all the Old Testament. You know, it's referred to again and again and again. And... The horse and his rider are central in this one. And God defeated the Egyptian army. He defeated the Egyptian horses and chariots because that's kind of the equivalent in their mind. So that's, again, that's what horses meant to the ancient world. <coughs> um, let's see. What did I hit next on this one? Oh, that's the Song of Moses, Exodus 15, 1 through 21. Um, Sometimes horses are used in a symbolic fashion. Okay. Um, the people of Israel plunged into sin with all the vigor of a horse charging into battle. Okay, that's, there's, a, there's a simile there. That, that Again, the idea of a horse plunging into battle in, with enthusiasm. Right? And the people were plunging into sin with enthusiasm. So that's the, uh, the kind of they chased idols the way a lusty stallion chased a mare. That's a couple of ways that the horse is used in, uh, in symbolic terms, in, in figures of speech. And then finally, James. We don't think of James talking about horses, but he re likens the tongue to a small bridle that can control a powerful and spirited horse. So even, you know, again, kind of like the lion, can be trapped. The horse can be controlled with a very small thing. You know, and again, I don't know horses, but you put a bridle in a horse's mouth and it's a very sensitive part, and you can pull on it and 
you know, those of you that know horses more than I do can, you know, can, f can fill in that picture. I'm inviting anybody that wants to do that. <laughs> um, so that's horses used in symbolic fashion in a certain way. Um, yeah, horses have trouble following. Okay, we've done that one. Uh, okay, now we're going to move to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is the longest and the most obscure of the minor prophets. So it's next to the last ver next to the last book in the Old Testament. So it's two books before Matthew. <clears throat> Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. All right. And surprisingly, Zechariah, he likes horses. <clears throat> and we talked about Zechariah a few weeks ago when we talked about donkeys. So let's start back with that one. Uh, Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. <clears throat> Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Uh, let me see. There we go. Let your king come to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey. Okay, and again, why would Jesus come into his triumphal entry on a donkey and not a horse? Fulfill scripture. Fulfill scripture, A. B, because he's coming as a friend. He's coming as a, you know, he, he's not coming to... To wage war. Not at this stage. We'll get to Revelation in, a little, in just a little bit. Okay. But that's, in fact, this one goes on to say, He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be cut off. He'll command peace to the nations. So, and we talked two weeks ago when we talked about donkeys, we said we looked at all four of the Gospels have a reference to this story. Two of them actually quote Zechariah. And all of them have a slightly different take. Some of them just say a colt. And you notice Zechariah says, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Not A lot of times, we, when we hear colt, we think horse. But colt is also the foal of a donkey. And that's why it has to be a donkey. It can't be a horse. Because even in Zechariah's verse, it says, he will cut off the chariot and the war horse from Jerusalem. And that's the reason he's riding a donkey or, and not a horse. Now, let's go back a little bit. Part of the book of Zechariah is eight night visions. Okay, so he is, he is out there and he sees in the night, he sees these visions. And we're going to look at number one and number eight. Chapter one of Zechariah, starting with verse seven. <clears throat> On the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of Shebat and the second year of Darius, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. Okay, let me get you here. Okay, go to the next one. This is the first night vision. That's what we're doing right now. Came to the word of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Iddo. And Zechariah said, In the night I saw a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen. And behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. And I said, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, They are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they spoke to the angel of the Lord. They spoke to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees. We have patrolled the earth, and lo, the whole earth remains at peace. That sounds good, doesn't it? But the next verse says. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, which you have been angry these 70 years? So they're disappointed with peace. They're expecting the Lord coming in like he did with the, with the Egyptians, right? They don't want peace. They want deliverance. You know, peace is not good if you're oppressed. <laughs> and that's kind of the, where he's coming from there. So he sees these these horsemen, and he says, okay, something's about to happen. But these aren't war horses. These are patrol cars. All right. 
So all these, you know, and you notice the only rider he talks about is the one on the first red horse. He was standing among other horses. And we don't know if angels were riding these other horses. Uh, you know, this is a whole thing in the book of Zechariah. I told you, I told you it was obscure. <clears throat> but he sees the horses and he sees, he's, he expects something. Okay, something's about to happen. And no, there's just peace. Okay, nothing's, you know, how long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord, until you bring deliverance? Then we're going to skip. There, there's six more. Six more night visions, and then we're going to go to vision number eight, which is uh, six, one through eight. Zechariah six, one through eight. And again, I looked up and saw four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses. The second chariot, black horses. The third chariot, white horses. And the fourth chariot, dappled gray horses. Does this remind you of anything? <laughs> yeah, this is pretty clearly John in the book of Revelation got his, you know, this image refers back to this story here, this image here. Four horses, each a different color. Now, he doesn't go beyond the, what the colors refer to or how that, what they mean here. And then I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? So that kind of happens every time. And that also happens in the book of Revelation. You know, the, John the Revelator says, what, what does this mean? You know, what's going on here? So that's also like Zechariah. What are these, my Lord? The angel answered me, these are the four winds of heaven going out after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses goes toward the north country. The white ones go toward the west country and the dappled ones go toward the south country. When the steeds came out, they were impatient to get off and patrol the earth. Here's that, patrol the earth again. And he said, go, patrol the earth. So they patrol the earth, and he cried out to me, Lo, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. So whatever happened in the north country, whether that was Mesopotamia or you know, Persia or whatever, nobody really knows, uh, they, they did good. <clears throat> And the word of the Lord came to me, collect silver and gold, okay, goes on there. But there's another image of horses connected with war. And this is a patrolling again, but they are, you know, it's a scary picture. And we, we, we're going to see when we get to the book of Revelation, that's, it gets scarier. Okay. Now, I have to say, the, one, of the, one of the advantages of doing this kind of a study is we get to look at verses we'd otherwise never, <laughs> never read. <laughs> okay. okay, so <clears throat> let's move. Okay, we're going to have to slow down. <laughs> Y'all are, are going to have to start talking a little bit. <clears throat> okay. So we're, we are ready for Revelation. And we'll start with chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> and I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals. Okay, what are we doing here? Okay. <clears throat> I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out as with a voice of thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And out came another horse, bright red. His rider was, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people would slaughter one another and was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a day's pay and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the, oil, the olive oil and the wine. We'll talk about these in a minute. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come! 
I looked and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. Okay, so these are the famous four horses of the apocalypse. They're really not football players. <laughs> Every once in a while, a football team will have four really powerful running backs, and they'll say, uh, four horses of the apocalypse. But uh, that's a pretty ugly image. Uh, I mean, it's even uglier, <laughs> uglier than Zechariah. So what are the four horses doing? Okay, the, first, the white horse represents uh, conquering, rec <clears throat> represents victory, conquest. Now, some people have said, okay, well, white horse, that must be Jesus on the horse. We'll talk about the, we'll talk about the white horse in a minute later on in the book of Revelation. But you know, if this is Jesus, he's keeping some pretty strange company. right? <clears throat> I, I think this is just... You, if you want to say demonic, if you want to say you know the enemies bringing destruction on on whether it's God's enemies or whether it's on the righteous. Um, anyway, and, and what's all this calm business? You know, he could be talking to the horses or the riders, saying, "You come." He could be talking to Jesus, saying, "Jesus, come soon." <clears throat> he could even be talking to John, and says, "Come, look at this." But I think the horses are more likely. <clears throat> so the first one, white horse, had a bow and a crown. He came out conquering and to conquer. So the first one represents conquest. The second one is war. A bright rider permitted to take peace from the earth so the people would slaughter one another. He was given a great... You know, he's not the slaughterer, but he's kind of causing people to kill each other. Like that would ever happen. Yeah. <clears throat> so, again, the first one represents conquest, the second one war. The third one, what is all this about a scale and a quarter of wheat? This is famine. This is representing the prices have gone so high that people can't afford to eat. Uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't read the same to us because we don't know what these, these amounts and these prices are, but that's the... That's the idea, is that he's got a scale, and he has caused famine in the land, and people are starving. And the last one, the pale or pale green. Yeah. Okay, so I guess this one is white, red, black, and pale. Uh, represents death, and Hades is, is riding with him. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about... Let's talk about the four horses. <laughs> Again, even though this is in the New Testament, this is probably one of the least, well, this is certainly the least read book in the New Testament. Um, and some of these pictures, even though all, all of us have probably heard about the four horses of the apocalypse, but we don't actually look at the text very often. Uh, so what's going on? Yeah, I know. It's revelation. <laughs> it's, it's symbolic. Okay. <clears throat> okay. But this is all part of, you know, the idea of revelation is whether it's the end time or whether it's the end of Jerusalem, it's apocalyptic literature. It all has symbolic, it meant things to them that it doesn't mean to us today. Yeah, Gail, please explain this to us. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that's the pattern. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not like anything new is going on here. No, it's yeah. Over yeah. And over and over again. It just depends on who's in charge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, and I'm, I think that's a, not a bad way to look at that. And, you know, we're going to see there is a, be there is a better ending. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to the better ending here in a minute. But, but this is the world. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you talk about war and famine, mm -hmm. death, mm -hmm. disease, you know, not one that says disease, but that could be death. Mm -hmm. Civil war, which is kind of the second one. Um, people killing each other, people af you know, going after each other. Um, that is the world. That's the world we live in. 
<clears throat> okay, so we do have another passage, and it will get better. <clears throat> okay, Revelation, anything else on the four horses? Okay, Revelation 19. Uh, Revelation 19, 11 through 21. <clears throat> okay. So this is, and, and the, the thing about the book of Revelation, you got to remember, it, it goes in cycles. I mean, it, it's, it, it's like it kills everybody in chapter 6, and then it kills everybody again in chapter 8, and then it kills everybody again in chapter 11, right? So it, it's kind of like telling the same story three or four different ways and three or four different times. So now we're kind of toward the end. Uh, how many chapters in Revelation? 22 chapters. So we're in Revelation chapter 19, so we're getting close. <clears throat> so verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Okay, there's a different feeling here now, isn't there? Its, its name is called Faithful and True, Wait a minute, isn't that a wedding song? <clears throat> and it makes war in righteousness. Uh, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed on a, in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come, gather for the great supper of God. Okay, again, that sounds good, but you know what birds eat in the Bible? The, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, and the flesh of horses and riders. Flesh of all, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast... And the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against the rider on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed in his presence the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast. So, <clears throat> and you notice how prominent the idea of the horse is in this, in this text. I mean, he mentions, mentions the horse really more, more than he mentions the rider. You know, the one on the, on the white horse. The, um, so this is kind of the climactic battle in, in Revelation that brings it to an end. And then we've kind of got a few um, thousand years and the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem and all that kind of follows after this. But this is, uh, in, my, in my mind, this is... God, through Jesus, overthrowing the way of the world, the way of the four horsemen, right? and bringing to a new world and a new heaven and new earth. Right. So, horses can be good, horses can be bad. Right? It depends on, depends on whether they're fighting for you or against you. But that's... Um, Okay, thoughts about this one? Uh, yeah, it's a, it, it's a, <laughs> it, Revelation is strange. I mean, there's no way, no way around that one. And that's hard for us to understand. And people have taken things with the book of Revelation and done horrible things with them. People like David Koresh and, yep. and, um, Other folks, yeah. Jim Jones. Yeah, Jim Jones, that's the name I was trying to think of, yeah. Um. But isn't it just an image that the people 
people at the time would recognize. Yeah, there's a whole theory about, you know, this is part of apocalyptic literature, and there was kind of a standard language with images and beasts, and Daniel in the Old Testament kind of has some of those same images. And we looked at the book of Zechariah that has some of those same images that were, that were common in the day, that people that were part of that would, would recognize. And that's... If we think about warfare, that's not what we think of. No. No, we sh- yeah, and we didn't talk about the helicopters in the Book of Revelation last week. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I mean, if in in some ways, I guess this whole this whole lesson today has been that when you read of a horse in the Bible, there's war somewhere. No, yeah. it's it's not it's not Pony Express. It's not. You know, it's not equine therapy. Horses in the Bible mean war. Somebody's, you know, somebody's trying to kill somebody else and probably successful. Uh, Do you think that the colors of the horses have any significance in the previous passage that we looked at earlier? Yeah, um... Yeah, it's kind of the same, yeah, in, as in Zechariah. Now, that, that, of course, Zechariah, he says, uh, the, one, the first horse was for the north, and the second horse was for the south. And, you know, he, the horses represent different directions, as in patrolling the earth. They're going all different directions to see. These are not patrolling. These are war horses. I mean, they are truly doing their real thing in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> so whether, you know, black meaning death is fairly common, white meaning conquest or pure. Clearly, the, for the rider in the white horse, in his army, the white represents purity and righteousness. Maybe in book of, for the, for the four horses, maybe not so much. It represents conquest. Uh, and I don't want to get into, you know, too much black, and, black versus white kind of stuff, but that's, there's a lot of... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of color symbolism, too. We don't really know. Zechariah doesn't tell us why these color. He doesn't say the colors mean anything. And, and John here doesn't refra- say why this one represents this. Maybe he expected his readers to know that. I was thinking red like kind of like mercury or something, you know, war. <clears throat> yeah, red is, you know, fire. It's anger. It's red hot. It's, you know, I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and this last one, pale green, pale. You can imagine somebody. He was he was ashy, ash. He turned yeah, ashen. He, he was white. It was kind of kind of sounds like death. Uh, yeah, I, I think apparently that's what the word means. But it's kind of yeah. We don't imagine a green horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the color green usually means uh, cool and calm yeah. and peaceful. But when people turn green, that, that's not a good sign. <laughs> yeah. Was East not mentioned in Zechariah? Mm-hmm. I didn't notice that. Um, <clears throat> black horses represented went to the north, white ones to the west, dapple ones go to the south. Yep, you're right, he left one out. Yeah, yeah it's not too hard to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, could be. Yeah, it could be. That's right. Yeah. East is Mediterranean Sea. No, it's west. Never mind. <laughs> okay, so let's just kind of wrap up the series. What have we learned? So we looked at lions. We looked at donkeys. Last week we looked at locusts. And now horses. So, And, and part of my, my thought process is that 
in the ancient world, they had a different relationship with animals than we do. You know, here in Houston, Texas, in 2024, you know, we've, we've got dogs, we've got cats, we've got squirrels in the attic, you know, we've got mosquitoes everywhere. But if we want to really see animals, we go to the zoo where they're behind, you know, behind bars. Uh, that we don't have that up-close personal relationship with animals that they did back then, even lions. I mean, li people living out in the countryside could hear a lion roar at night. And they'd go, uh, ooh, because <clears throat> that, that, that's part of their, the world that they lived in. But understanding how they interacted with lions, and uh, <laughs> with lions, with, with various animals, including like the, the war horse and the Job passage where he talks about the emotional connection. I mean, you, you just feel like horses share your emotion. And again, I don't know horses very well, but that seems to be even watching a race, a horse race. It seems like the horses want to win just as bad as the jockey does. And again, maybe they've been bred to do that. I don't know, but there's a connection that people can have with animals that some of us feel with our dogs. I don't know if anybody can really feel that with a cat, but that's, that's me. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Joe. As long ago or as short ago, 100 years, we still had horses. Yeah. The army rode horses. They, uh, horses were a main part. They called them the cavalry. Right. And the horses were part of the battle. Yeah. And Teddy Roosevelt. Up yeah, San Juan Hill. <clears throat> yep. Now then, we've gone away from the horse cavalry. You may have talked about this before, but we're in helicopters. <laughs> yeah. And but the idea of what the horses were doing, we've just put on machines. Yeah. And, and that's why. And, and I guess World War One. At the beginning of World War One, they brought some horses out. And the uh, horses don't do well against machine guns, nor do people, for that matter. But that pretty well did an end to battle horses. Now, they were still used for transport. They were still bringing things up to the front. Um, and not just military, but civilians use horses for everything, you know, everyday life. Milk wagons. Milk wagons. You know, you would own a horse or, you know, to, to go from here to there. Um, somebody would be cleaning up horse poop in the, in the cities, right? I mean, that was a big part of, of life as little as 100 years ago, like Joe said. It, that is well, that... We call modern life as opposed to what yeah. we've been talking about yeah. today. Yeah, and really up until, like I say, up until the machine gun, a rider on a horse was about as scary as anything, was as scary a military thing as you can get, at least a single person. Um, so we, me we measure uh, the, the horsepower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Germans still used them in World War II for supply, carrying supplies, <clears throat> and, uh, especially on the Eastern Front. Yeah, yeah. Not a patrol now. Sheriffs, border Yeah, yeah. So the machines can't go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and sometimes I think you know, part of what this series is intended to do is to kind of help put us in a mindset of a, a biblical world that in a lot of ways is very different from ours. You know, right. I, uh, that, you know, and, and these am, animals all had a certain amount of symbolic value. Like, you know, we talked about the horses, they plunged into sin like a horse plunges into battle. Um, you know, locusts, uh, although they have no king, they can work together. You know, that, that was kind of the symbolic thing about locusts. Um, we talked about donkeys. You know, there were 6,700 donkeys mentioned in the Bible. Now, granted, it was in one verse, but that's... <laughs> um, but, I mean, that, that, they lived in that world. You know, and I might mention when we talked about donkeys, we mentioned David and his family liked mules. Okay? We see, 30, we see David's sons riding on their mules to Absalom's house. He had invited them all for a big dinner. 
And when they got there, Absalom killed Amnon, who had raped his sister. And it says all the other king's sons were scared to death. And they got on their mules and went back home. And it, just, just, it seems kind of ludicrous to us for king's sons to be riding on mules. But that's what horses were not ridden on for ordinary peaceful purposes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sancho Panza rode a donkey. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's kind of where we've gone with this one and looking at various kind of a inside picture of how people live there. Now, at some point, we may do a sequel. I've got four other animals we can talk about, no, including snakes. But um, so... It, we don't have anything else? Okay, we can, we can go. You can, you can go laugh at the people over there. <laughs> All right, thank you. I've enjoyed it.